Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Conservative Human Rights Commission event. Tonight, we are here to launch a major new report on China entitled The Darkness Deepens. In recent years, there have been an increasing number of reports about human rights abuses in China, but what is unique about this report is that it brings these comprehensively together, illustrating the crackdown on human rights across the board. The picture it paints is of a brutal regime suppressing its citizens. Four years ago, the Conservative Human Rights Commission launched a report on China entitled The Darkest Moment. And this report tonight demonstrates that in the, in the years since, the darkness has deepened. I should emphasize that this report is not an attack on China or the Chinese people. However, it is highly critical of their present government, the Chinese communist regime. Tonight, we have some absolutely outstanding speakers. And at the end, I hope there will be time for a few questions. But because we have so many people on this event, please do send your questions in on the question and answer function. So without more ado, we are going to our first speaker, who is Benedict Rogers, who is a human rights activist and writer, and he has been responsible for producing this report. He is co-founder and deputy chair of this commission, co-founder and chief executive of Hong Kong Watch, senior analyst for East Asia at CSW, and an advisor to both the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC, and the Stop the Uyghur Genocide Campaign. He's lived in Hong Kong and China, has an MA in China Studies from SOAS, and in 2017 was denied entry to Hong Kong on the orders of Beijing. And he is going to introduce the report and the recommendations. Ben, over to you. Well, Baroness Hodgson, thank you very much indeed. And it's a, a great privilege to present our report and to do so alongside uh, such a distinguished panel. As Baroness Hodgson has already uh, said, this report is significant for a number of reasons. Firstly, it illustrates uh, a massive deterioration in the human rights situation in recent years, reaching the levels of, increasingly experts argue, uh, of genocide in the case of uh, the Uyghurs, and serious breaches of an international treaty in the case of Hong Kong. But as has already been emphasized, uh, the repression, those two issues are rightly receiving growing attention, but the repression is across the board. Uh, Christians are facing the worst persecution since the Cultural Revolution. Uh, repression in Tibet is intensifying. Uh, persecution of Falun Gong continues. And the elimination of space for civil society, human rights defenders, lawyers, bloggers, citizen journalists, whistleblowers, as we've seen in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, or any form of dissent. In other words, no one today is safe. And that includes foreign nationals. Uh, we see a growing number of cases. We've documented them in the report. Uh, you'll hear from Simon Cheng, a Hong Kong citizen and employee of the British consulate in Hong Kong at the time, uh, shortly. Uh, but a number of foreign nationals who are in prison in torture, imprisoned and tortured uh, in China uh, uh, or threatened uh, beyond China's borders. And even in the case of Gui Min Hai, a Chinese-born Swedish national, uh, he was abducted from Thailand and is now serving a 10-year prison sentence uh, in China. Secondly, the, what we found is that the regime has uh, developed in recent years new tools of repression, in particular endemic slave labor, uh, the development of surveillance technologies to create essentially an Orwellian surveillance state, the use of forced televised confessions, the implementation of new laws that allow within, within the so-called legal system for arbitrary detentions and disappearances, and the continued widespread uh, use of torture and forced organ harvesting. But the report is also significant because in contrast to our previous report, which Baroness Hodgson referred to, uh, we are in somewhat different political times. When that report, The Darkest Moment, was published in 2016, uh, it was at the uh, height of the so-called uh, golden era of Sino-British relations. 
and let's just say that our commission was not uh, that popular in certain circles in Westminster and beyond uh, because of our, uh, our, our report. Uh, whereas I think uh, today we can honestly say uh, that whereas then we were canaries in the coal mine, um, we are uh, definitely not uh, alone. This report is endorsed by two former foreign secretaries, two former party leaders, the chair of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, the last governor of Hong Kong, and several other distinguished parliamentarians. Uh, and I should just say the reason we chose the title, The Darkness Deepens, is of course a reflection uh, of uh, the worsening situation since our last report. The, the title of the last report was chosen from the words of a Chinese dissident who gave evidence to us four years ago, who said that at that time, it was the darkest moment since the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, and uh, of course, we had a slight linguistic challenge over uh, 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 concluding that that last title was perhaps a bit premature, but uh, that's why we uh, called this The Darkness Deepens. But while the darkness is deepening, uh, at the same time, more people are waking up uh, and shining uh, a light uh, on it. Um, before I conclude, uh, let me um, say, first of all, a, a very big thank you to everybody who has been involved in helping to prepare this report. I can't uh, name everyone, but I want to thank our, uh, my fellow commissioners for all the time they've invested uh, many hours of hearings uh, and, and listening to horrific evidence. Uh, a special thank you to our volunteer uh, designer, Jasmine, who spent many hours voluntarily uh, making the report. Uh, the report is a report of substance, but it's also visually very striking, and I pay tribute to her. I want to thank Erolina and other colleagues for the help on the technical side today, and to, to everyone who entirely volu voluntarily uh, came together to make this happen, and most of all, to the courageous witnesses. Uh, this is uh, their work uh, and their story. So very finally, what do we do? Well, we have uh, a number of recommendations, but the key recommendations are firstly, we call on the government to conduct a, a wholesale and comprehensive review uh, of our relationship with not the people of, or the country of China, but the Chinese Communist Party regime, uh, and to uh, reset uh, our strategy uh, and our approach. Specifically, we call for uh, targeted sanctions, uh, we recommend uh, diversifying supply chains uh, and particularly to ensure that the scandal of slave labor uh, uh, ends. And we welcome the statement that we heard yesterday from the Foreign Secretary, but we would say that there is much, much more uh, to do uh, beyond that. Uh, we call for the establishment of mechanisms for uh, accountability, uh, including as uh, 50 United Nations special rapporteurs have recommended the creation of a UN Special Rapporteur on China. And lastly, we urge the British government to work with allies to build a united front uh, among democracies uh, to counter the Chinese Communist Party's own so-called united front. If the free world stands together, we can push back against Beijing. We must stand up for our values, defend our interests, uh, and rethink our relationship with this brutal regime. The report concludes, and I conclude, by quoting the words of the China Tribunal, chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, who said that those interacting with this regime should do so in the knowledge that they are, quote, interacting with a criminal state. Our conclusion to the report ends with a description of the uh, images of repression that are detailed throughout the report. Uh, and it uh, concludes with these words, these are the images that reveal the truth about the mendacity, brutality, inhumanity, insecurity, and criminality of the Chinese Communist Party regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. And, you know, this is a remarkable report, and I know you put many, many hours of work into it. And thank you for introducing it succinctly but actually highlighting the many um, abuses that have, have come through in this report. So our spec second speaker is Nathan Law, who was elected as the youngest legislator in the Legislative Council for Hong Kong Island in 2016, aged just 23. 
but was disqualified in July 2017 for quoting Mahatma Gandhi when he took his oath. He was then sentenced to eight months in jail in August 2017 for his role in leading the 2014 Umbrella Movement protest, but was released on bail after two months. In July 2020, as the national security law was imposed on Hong Kong, he went into exile and is now based in London. He was voted among Time magazine's 100 most influential, uh, influential people and received the 2020 Magnitsky Award for Outstanding Opposition Figure of the Year. He has been nominated alongside other Hong Kong activists by members of the US Congress and British Parliament for the Nobel Peace Prize. Nathan, we're looking forward to hearing from you about Hong Kong. Thank you so much for your introduction, uh, Baroness Huxon, and uh, thank you so much for the entire committee for pro producing this remarkable um, report on the human rights violation of China and the things that the UA UK government should do. Um, I think this is a very important piece because um, in before, when we think of China, let's say a decade ago, it, people thought that it would be um, democratized, it would be free, and thought that it would be a peacemaker and dealing with uh, the other democratic countries very nicely. But in fact, uh, the whole Western world or uh, democrat, dem um, democracies got it wrong. Um, China didn't go into a direction of uh, becoming free and democratic, but definitely they're going into the exact opposite way. The classic modernization theory failed. So I think it is really important for us to raise awareness about the true nature and the essence of uh, the uh, one-party dictatorship in China, and by producing these remarkable reports, we can have a much more comprehensive feel on uh, what's happening in China and what should we do, um, no matter as a country or as a community uh, glued by uh, our democratic values. So um, I really do hope that uh, the UK uh, government and the, the other uh, countries, to be um, honest, uh, can adopt um, the following uh, recommendations and uh, these insights could really provide us an opportunity to go against uh, the ever expanding authoritarianism from China. Um, so uh, in the past four years, um, since the last report came out, uh, the situation in China and Hong Kong, as Ben just said, has been deteriorated uh, in a remarkable scale. Uh, me, myself, as a personal example, could really demonstrate that. In the year 2016, after the Umbrella Movement in 2014, two years after that, I could still run for office. I, I was elected as the youngest um, ever uh, parliamentarian in Hong Kong at the age of 23. And I indeed took office uh, for nine months, uh, questioning the government, providing uh, policy advice, and really representing my people. But eventually, I was disqualified in 2017, and it was reversibly seen as a political persecution. And the reason was very absurd. It was just me quoting Gandhi and uh, speaking uh, on behalf of my people about my me playing allegiance to the people instead of the regime that brutally kills its people. And afterwards, I was uh, jailed and became a political uh, prisoner. And for now, I had to uh, live in a life of exile. Uh, I had to leave Hong Kong in order uh, to protect my, myself and to be able to continuously speaking for Hong Kong people on the international level. So these um, incidents that um, I encountered really demonstrate uh, the deterioration of Hong Kong's freedom. And I believe that uh, the, the, the testimonies from um, the following speakers will demonstrate another layer of what's happening in, in Hong Kong, in China, and to show to the world that we indeed have to take actions um, some of the recommendations, I, I do really hope that uh, more and more countries could adopt. For example, um, consolidating an alliance to think of ways to combat that authoritarian expansion from China, um, targeting sanctions on Hong Kong and China officials that are responsible for human rights violation, and also navigating a uh, uh, UK-China policy that could genuinely hold this um, giant um, autocracy accountable. These are our uh, shared values, and I believe that the world should prioritize human rights over trade, and we should act before it is too late. Now, we are facing a globalized world. We are facing a much more sophisticated method of infiltration, um, surveillance, and soft and short power um, 
expanded by uh, these authoritarian regimes. And we democracies have to act in an orchestrated and coordinated way in order to preserve our values. Uh, in the last decade, we've been talking about the decline of democracy. And I believe that the genuine reason of that is we actually fed up this uh, authoritarian regime. We think we, we had wishful thinking about it becoming our allies without us holding them accountable and they act with impunity. And for now, this has to change. So I think this report does give a really good starting point to think about, to re-strategize our approach to these authoritarian regimes. And I do really recommend all those people who are concerned by what's happening in mainland China or focus on its uh, policy or politics or even Indo-Pacific uh, geopolitics in, in, in specific, could take a look at it and you will find a very comprehensive uh, report on um, the findings and the recommendation. So thank you once again for the commission uh, to produce that very important piece. And I um, do hope that we can actually formulate a much more stronger alliance to cope with uh, the China's rising and its autocracy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nathan. And we really appreciate you being with us this evening. And I think you laid it out very clearly about the authoritarian regime acting with such impunity. Our next speaker is Rahima Mahmoud, who is a Uyghur singer, human rights activist, and award-winning translator of the poignant prison memoir, The Land Drenched in Tears, by Soyungul Chanishev. Her latest work includes working as a consultant and translator for the ITV documentary, Undercover, Inside China's Digital Gulag, shown on, in July 2019, which won ma many major awards, including a BAFTA TV and International Emmy on Current Affairs in 2020. Currently, she is the UK project, project director of the World Uyghur Congress, and she is going to speak to us about the situation for the Uyghurs. Good evening, and uh, it's a privilege for me uh, to be here with you all and to speak from my own experience what is happening to my people. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for Ben and his team to produce such, such an important and timely report. Um, as uh, being Uyghur, myself, uh, you know, leaving my country uh, in 2000, for the last 20 years, I was unable to uh, go home. Um, born in a beautiful city called the Rolja in the northwestern part of what I call it East Turkestan. I was brought up in a large religious family and the discrimination and the persecution of the Uyghur people has a long history. From my childhood until I left my homeland in 2000, I experienced uh, frequent discrimination. And the reason I left my country was the Hulja massacre, which took place in February the 5th, 1997. Since coming to the UK in 2000, I have been unable to return home because of my activism against Chinese government in support of my people. And last time I spoke to my brother was in January the 3rd. He told me in a trembling voice, please leave us in the hands of God and we will also leave you in God's hands. And my work as interpreter and translator bring me into contact with first-hand account of suffering in the notorious 21st century concentration camps, as well as the heart-wrenching tales of mothers and fathers who have lost their children, young and old. Every Uyghur family has a similar story, each more horrifying than the other of the effect of the brutal ethnic cleansing and genocide that have been taken place since 2017, while the world closes its eyes to their sufferings. The most painful part of the job is not being able to offer words of comfort 
and hope in the midst of the torment. Since August 2018, when the UN acknowledged that there were up to 1 million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims interned in what the Chinese called re-education camps, a growing number of courageous individuals have been working towards exposing the truth of life behind their walls. I worked as consultant and translator for the documentary Undercover, China's Digital Gulag by Robin Banwell, which was broadcast on ITV in July 2019. And uh, uh, featured former camp internees and material gained through an undercover operative. I was horrified when a Chinese official was asked whether he felt Uyghur's human rights were being violated. And he responded by saying, they don't have human rights. It is not about violations, they just don't have human rights. And this is a situation that our very basic rights are taken away from us by this brutal, cruel regime. I, just before I started my speech, I received an, a message uh, from uh, Ziba, uh, whose mother, Dr. Uh, Gulshan Abbas, uh, disappeared two years ago and uh, uh, recently, they learned she was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. So there are millions of my people at the moment are suffering unbearable, unbearable pain. And I myself are suffering too, uh, because I don't know any information about what happened to my, my people. And I do uh, welcome uh, the report the announcement, uh, Foreign Secretary's announcement yesterday, uh, but I feel it's still very little compared to the scale of what is happening. And I do, I, I heard how he acknowledged uh, the industrial scale of the abuse that we are suffering. Therefore, I really, my plea is we need, we Uyghurs need uh, justice. The justice only can be done through court. So I want, I ask you, if any MP is sitting here listening to me, please vote for the genocide amendment to the trade bill. Thank you. Rahima, thank you very much. I mean, your testimony is very sobering, and I think all our hearts go out to you. It must be terrible. Uh, to have gone through what you've gone through. Our next speaker is Simon Cheng, who worked for the British Consulate General in Hong Kong until his arrest at the high-speed rail terminal in Hong Kong upon his return from a business trip to mainland China in 2019. He was imprisoned in mainland China, where he endured shocking torture. After his release, he came to the UK, where he sought and secured asylum. He gave evidence at one of our inquiries hearings and will share a brief summary of his experience now. Simon, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, thanks for your invitation, Baroness. And uh, also thanks for Bands to explain uh, briefly about the UK uh, response and what should we act. And thanks for Rahima uh, talk about the Uyghurs in China, especially thanks for Nathan and perfectly cover the Hong Kong issues and really thanks for the effort he always has been doing in the UK. So let me introduce myself. I'm Simon. I'm a former employee of the British Consulate General Hong Kong. So in the summer on to, of 2019, I was abducted on my business trip from Hong Kong High Speed Railway Station by Chinese mainland Chinese National Security Police and taken back to Shenzhen, where I was held for two weeks accused by of being a spy for the UK, torture, and forced to make a film and false confession to the charges of the prostitutions and lately treason. So I'm currently a refugee, being all citizens, and also with respectful statesman Nathan Law and others as one of the activists in exiles on the warrant list issued by the Hong Kong National Security Police. 
So I, here I wanted to give you more about my personal experience, the concrete examples to explain uh, what kind of the issues of the rule of law uh, in China, the judicial systems. I would raise nine points of the human rights abuse on my cases. So the first, I would say that the mainland Chinese police, they gave no reason and showed no badges to breach the personal privacy of citizens. They extract biometric information from people, detained and interrogate citizens in a small cage and a tiger chair. Second, a flagrant interrogation about political opinion secretly threatened citizens with mainland Chinese law to judge the behaviors of criticizing government in Hong Kong, systematically detains Hong Kong protesters and abruptly breaches one country, two systems. So that time even was in August, 2019, far before the national security law had been imposed by Beijing in Hong Kong. Third, there has multiple decisions to document, including softer and harder charges and treatments to threaten citizens to succumb, such as giving fingerprints on a blank basis of state and reason of the documents. They arbitrarily control the period and the reason of the detention. Fourth, using re-education through shattering and other draconian laws as excuses to further extend administrative detention in order to execute the political persecution. This can detain citizens for two years without a due process of court trial and legal support of lawyer. Fifth, violate the rule of detention center that's no hours for education and exercise, exclude the rights to purchase daily necessities and toiletries, giving no reason to be thrown into solitary confinement for 14 days as part of psychological torture. Six, keep asking out for interrogation during the whole period of detention, execute physical torture and falsely enforce confession. The police access my phone using violence, grab my hair to enhance the facial recognition, hang me up at the X-shaped board and force to raise hands, squat and stand for long hours. Deprive sleep, punish to sing Chinese anthem and beaten with shape and baton. Seven, they hide the evidence of torture. They deliberately they politicize the case, afford to mention state security. The secret police is in charge of the case. They mislead the public opinion away from political motivated accusation and persecution. The Chinese police, state media, and foreign ministry collude together in a smear campaign using non-political charges against dissidents, blatantly lied about legal rights have been respected, no torture and mistreatment, and confess with solid evidence. Eighth, we're not allowed it to contact with lawyer and family, postpone and even block the whole communication with Hong Kong side and external parties. The Chinese secret police even hide the detainees' whereabouts from lawyers and family members. They delete the trace record on the official system. If the case cannot get public attention and media exposure, the detainees could be directly disappeared. The last but not least, if speaking out anything other than solicit prostitution, they frame me up, the accusation falsely and unfortunately made by Chinese authorities to the media and the public, the secret police blatantly threaten the whistleblower must be abducted from Hong Kong to mainland China, and the excerpts and family in mainland China and even Hong Kong could be in trouble. So here I also wanted to raise several examples that experience very similarly to me. For example, like Wang Chuanzhang, a human rights lawyer in mainland China, was also commanded to stand for 15 hours with his hands up in the air. And when he dropped them, he was yelled at as a traitor. He said he became so weak that he was unable to stand even for a few minutes. And also such as um, uh, Xu Zhangren, a professor of jurisprudence and constitutional law and at Tsinghua University in Beijing, and he also was framed up as solicitor prostitution because he is a half wing critic of Xi Jinping. Also, Grandma Wong, um, our lovely Hong Kong grandma, uh, who waving Union Jet always uh, in the protests in Hong Kong. When she back to Shenzhen, she was administratively detained and afterwards criminally detained and had been forced to 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 to, to do patriotic education in Shanxi provinces. And finally, Li Mengju, 
he had been detained also in August uh, 2019, and uh, due to the so-called violating national security, he was the second Taiwanese had been detained, persecuted politically, and so far there has no update. So we can see always there has many, many, many cases also commonly happens in mainland China. So I wanted to leave it to Mr. Tom Bell, who is a heavy wing academia and human rights lawyers can share more about his experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And um, what a terrible time you've been through too. Um, must have been a completely shocking experience. So our next speaker is Dr. Teng Biao, who is an academic, lawyer, and a human rights activist. He was formerly a lecturer in the China University of Political Science and Law, a visiting fellow at Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Since 2003, Dr. Teng has represented numerous human rights cases in China, including those of rural rights advocate Cheng Guancheng, rights defender Hu Jia, the religious freedom case of Falun Gong, and many death penalty cases. He co-founded Open Constitution Initiative and is also the founder and president of China Against the Death Penalty, Beijing. His research in interest includes human rights, constitutionalism, criminal justice, legal theory, democratic theory, transitional justice, and social movements. And we look forward to hearing from him an overview of human rights and legal systems in Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction, um, and thank you, Ben, for um, and, and all the people contributing to this uh, wonderful report. Um, I'm a, a scholar and human rights lawyer in China. Because of my uh, human rights work, um, I was uh, banned from teaching and eventually uh, fired uh, by the university. I was disbarred and uh, put under uh, house arrest and uh, I was kidnapped by Chinese secret police and uh, severely uh, tortured. Um, so since uh, early 2000s, uh, with limited space of internet and the legal professions, uh, we human rights lawyers and activists uh, started the rights defense movement. We took uh, human rights cases, organized uh, NGOs and uh, protested against the torture, corruption and uh, uh, forced eviction and injustice, but we experienced a severe crackdown by the Chinese authorities. And especially uh, for the past five years, as the report uh, documented and analyzed the darkness deepened, hundreds of human rights lawyers were uh, disbarred, disappeared uh, and convicted. Some of them are still in prison. Thousands of NGOs shut down. Thousands of uh, churches were destroyed. Tens of thousands of human rights activists and the petitioners are in detention. And all religions are uh, being persecuted, especially uh, Muslims, Falun Gong, uh, Tibetan Buddhists, and uh, underground Christians. Uh, torture is rampant uh, in China. From my experience as a um, a uh, lawyer and scholar, almost all criminal suspects and uh, uh, detainees, um, uh, including political prisoners, were tortured. Uh, at least one million people in Xinjiang, East Turkestan, um, are detained in concentration camps simply because they are Uyghurs or Hazaks or Muslims. What's happening uh, there is uh, literally a genocide. It is the worst humanitarian disaster in 21st century. Chinese government also forced 500,000 Tibetan farmers into uh, military style labor camps. In December 2019, dozens of human rights defenders uh, were arrested after a citizen meeting in Xiamen, which was uh, part of the citizens' movement. The leading Human rights lawyer Dr. Xu Ziyong was arrested in February 2020 and kept in Kandu since then. Xi Jinping waged a war on law after uh, he took his office, and the war on law has been even more intensified. 
besides the uh, roundup of dissidents, lawyers, bloggers, and church activists, Xi Jinping removed the presidential term limit from the Chinese constitution, which turned China from a collective dictatorship to a personal dictatorship. The whole world is now fighting the pandemic, which uh, resonated in China. Chinese government covered up the, the outbreak of coronavirus and silenced the whistleblowers. Zhang Zhan, Chen Qiu Shi, um, Fang Bin, uh, who courageously uh, told the truth of the pandemic, are still in prison or in disappearance. Uh, Wuhan citizen Chen Hejian was beaten to death when, uh, by local uh, police when he escaped uh, his own home during uh, quarantine. The Chinese government utilized methods of dealing with coronavirus to uh, tighten its control on society, like the health code has been a huge threat to privacy. The Chinese Communist Party has established what I call a high-tech totalitarianism. The great firewall, social media, big data, and modern telecommunications make it easier for the CCP to keep people under total surveillance. The internet has been used as an effective tool for censorship, propaganda, and brainwashing, um, like a, a facial recognition, voice print recognition, DNA, and surveillance cameras have all systemized the CCP's growing control. And why the crackdown uh, is so severe? On the one hand, the uh, dress defense movement, the civil uh, society, uh, had achieved uh, like uh, it became more and more organized and politicized and uh, uh, institutionalized. And on the other hand, the Chinese Communist Party uh, sees the the dress defense movement as a, a urgent threat to the one party system and their number one uh, priority to maintain its uh, monopoly on power. The final point I want to make uh, is that the Chinese government violates human rights not only in China, but also beyond its borders. I can give you thousands of uh, examples, but just think about uh, the case of uh, Gui Minhai, uh, Ben just mentioned, a Swedish citizen based in Thailand was kidnapped by Chinese secret police and sent back to China, forced to give up his Swedish citizenship and the torture, given a 10-year imprisonment and forced to reapply a Chinese passport. The direct reason is he published books on Chinese uh, top leaders, including one on uh, Xi Jinping's uh, sex scandal. And think about the Article 38 of Hong Kong's national security law, which actually targets everyone in the world who um, advocates Hong Kong independence or, or simply uh, criticizes Beijing's Hong Kong policy. So uh, it's high time for the world to stop appeasing the Chinese government and pay more attention to uh, human rights in China. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you also tell a very sobering tale indeed. And I think your uh, statement of war on law uh, is, is really uh, chilling, to be honest. Um, so our last speaker this evening is Sir Ian Duncan Smith MP, who is the former leader of the Conservative Party, former Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and founder of the Centre for Social Justice. He is a co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC, a member of parliament for Chingford and Wood Green. Sir Ian, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh for organizing all of this, and for most of all, for the report, The Darkness Deepens. Uh, I have uh, read through, and uh, not all of it at the moment, but I have certainly got through a large amount of it, and I've looked certainly at the executive summaries. And I just want to start by thanking uh, all those who just preceded me to uh, talk about their own experiences or knowledge of what's been going on. Uh, I thought the um, uh, what Benedict Rogers spoke about, which is the growing uh, casual uh, non-tolerance of dissent, imprisonment and torture, uh, the use of new tools, slave labor, surveillance state, arbitrary detention, uh, were really powerful descriptions of um, what is, it, it happened so slowly. It's a bit like watching the tide rise in a way that you don't begin to notice that it, you're no longer standing on firm ground, that actually 
you're mostly in the water and it happens so slowly perhaps that people don't realize and particularly not in the west until suddenly they see it it's a criminal state uh nathan law who we've uh, attended meetings together uh, a huge admirer of yours and of your uh individual stand and also like all your colleagues talk about one party dictatorship which in essence this is and we've seen this again and again when uh, when powerful people can no longer be challenged uh, and crack down as they have done. And the arbitrary rule uh, and the arrests and the eradication of opposition, uh, particularly uh, in the assembly. Uh, I thought um, Rahim Amut's uh, personal testimony, very powerful, if you don't mind me saying so, I, uh, quite moving really. Uh, you talk about family and about your family and never seeing your family and hearing from your family about saying essentially that they are no longer have any capability to uh, resolve matters for themselves but are in the hands of God and the brutal ethnic cleansing uh, in Xinjiang province uh, amongst the people that uh, from whom you come uh, and um, thank you very much indeed for mentioning the genocide amendment uh, I wish we could encapsulate that and send it around all my colleagues who are humming and hawing at the moment about whether to stick their necks out um, and vote for it. Simon Cheng, uh, all this stuff about the, your abduction and your being held on suspicion, the interrogations, the way that they're detaining citizens, uh, no trial, um, solitary confinement. These are all testimonies, I think, of a, of a state that we have seen many times before in the past and we have experienced uh, and in many of those cases, we've done absolutely nothing. And we've seen what happens as a result, emboldened by the in inaction of uh, members of the free world. Uh, they think they can get away with everything. And finally, Teng Biao, um, your experience as a human rights lawyer uh, and uh, your, your comments about the numbers of people now being detained. And also the stuff that you've said about the Tibetans, it's often forgotten now. I raised this the other day but uh, people have kind of moved on from Tibet and rather forgotten that Tibet has been persecuted by the Chinese, frankly, illegally, uh, the Chinese government for a long, long time. And the recent evidence uh, from Adrian Zenz, I think it was, but certainly from the commission that uh, there were about half a million people now moved into labor camps uh, as well. And something that I didn't hear anybody mention, but I want to come back to you, which is, and it's already moving uh, in Inner Mongolia, uh, the same trends are moving, the banishment of the language and the uh, slow crackdown on any signs that uh, uh, you are not part of, the, of that process. So I really want to say that it's a huge privilege, obviously, to have uh, followed all of you with your personal experience and your knowledge, and also to be uh, speaking on the advent of this particular report, which I think is uh, really remarkable. Uh, I think it is, although a conservative report. It is in fact a, a, a report that speaks to people of all parties and none uh, and into the House of Commons and Parliament. I think you'll find there are many people on all sides of the House who will consider this to be a, a, a powerful and positive testimony uh, and I recommend that it is circulated as far as possible. Uh, I've uh, come to this uh, because I've, when we went down the road, I was in government at the time of the Golden uh, the golden decade or whatever it was meant to be called. I had my suspicions that there was something fundamentally wrong with this. It was as though we wanted to invent a concept of China that didn't exist and then trade with that rather than trade with the reality. And uh, I was particularly stung at the time when I had to attend a lecture. Uh, I say a lecture, I suppose it was meant to be a speech, but I thought it was a lecture really uh, by um, the president of China who arrived over uh, to speak to us in um, Parliament. And uh, he really lectured us all about how, um, how basically we, were, uh, uh, we weren't uh, uh, democratic in the sense that he considered uh, China to be democratic, which I thought was really rather absurd. Um, and uh, we got a lecture about how we shouldn't meddle in other people's affairs uh, and how this relationship would be based on the basis that um, uh, we didn't interfere in what was going on with them. I, I, I was so concerned about it, I was about to stand up and walk out uh, when the chief whip of my party, as I was in government as Secretary of State, uh, pulled my sleeve and tugged me down. He said, don't do it right now because 
it will embarrass the prime minister. And the one regret that I had is I never walked out on that, uh, on that uh, particular performance. And from that moment onwards, I have looked carefully at all that's going on. And, uh, you know, whichever way you look here, you know, we, we find the free world turns a blind eye if they can possibly manage it. Uh, the the Sino-British agreement over Hong Kong is trashed. Uh, the whole arrangement about the uh, way in which this would be a one country, two systems is gone. Uh, the loss of patience of China with Taiwan, uh, no longer thinking that it's necessary and therefore they may have to take China, Taiwan by force uh, or by threats. Uh, the incarceration of all of those people that uh, we have spoken about without trial. And if they do have a trial, it's a sham. Uh, the persecution of those who are civil rights lawyers uh, who wish to stand up for those who have the rights, although they're not recognized. And I thought very powerfully uh, the statement that, um, uh, that the Uyghur do not have rights. They don't have rights. They must be subhuman in some sense. Where have we heard that before? Where did we hear that before? Well, that would be back in the 1940s uh, when the, uh, the Germans, the Nazi party, uh, decided that the Jews were, were untermensch, subspecies, people that should be herded and used and then got rid of. Uh, and we didn't pay any attention to it. Uh, well, people complained about the problems of it, but too often governments uh, thought they could deal with that government and look what happened. And so I, I do think that, uh, uh, that the reality for us now is that my government, governments of the free world, now have to take a stand over this. We have to say that you cannot divorce trade, you cannot divorce finance, you cannot divorce uh, these elements that so benefit China uh, uh, from the reality of what happens to the people in that country. Surely we don't want to interfere in the workings of every country, but there are moments uh, when countries cross the line, when no longer their citizens have the have the power to be able to manage their lives that don't have the rights and don't have those rights of free speech uh, to uh, be supported. And it's time that the British government made it very clear. The government says they want a relationship with China. They want a cooperation with China and they want to be able to have uh, a good relationship based on the ability to trade. But my question really is how long can we, how long can we turn away from that which damages our ability to work with such people. Um, it's really important. Today we had a debate uh, on the genocide amendment and it, this was one that was in the finance bill. We weren't going to move it today to uh, try and vote on it because of the one that's coming in on the trade bill, which now is due in on Tuesday. And I'm urging my colleagues to support that. It would be the first time that a government has given the power to a domestic court uh, to rule on whether or not genocide is happening in a particular country. I believe actually, although they won't probably have a direct and immediate effect, it will have an effect, I think, on the way that the world looks again at how we do this. For 80 years, we have spent our time condemning genocide, but doing absolutely nothing about it. The list of countries that has continued uh, to abuse its people and to commit genocide uh, is quite a long one. And not once have we held them to account on the basis that it is genocide. Why? Because of course the UN cannot refer it to the, uh, to the ICC because every time the Security Council wants to do it, it is of course vetoed, more often than not vetoed by either Russia or China. Uh, and the only way therefore is to bring it to our own courts. So if we can pass this amendment, I think we will fire a shot, a shot that I hope will resonate around the world uh, that we can no longer turn a blind eye or tolerate these abuses that leave human beings in such desperate circumstances, no matter where they live and no matter how far away from us uh, that they live, uh, they are part of the human race and we need to stand up for them. And I hear that the Americans may even think about doing the same. And then who knows, maybe we can persuade the Europeans and others uh, to follow suit. So I think this report is Phenomenal. I think uh, it carries out, uh, sorry, it, it, it espouses all of the ideas that I can see and believe in, and it also shines a light uh, in the darkness of what now has become the darkness of communist run China. And I hope to live long enough to see the day when we see those freedoms restored and the common sense of man restored in China again. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Sir Ian. It's been um, really interesting to hear your observations on all this. Um, we've got a, a few minutes for some questions. And so actually I was um, going to start by asking you, what do you think the chances are of the genocide amendment being passed through the House of Commons uh, to the trade bill? Um, obviously in that we sent it back from the Lords with this amendment. Do you think that you will, that your colleagues will be persuaded to support this? Uh, it's always a difficult question to answer. And I don't want to bog people down here in what's called procedure. So uh, forgive me if I sketch over it a little bit. Um, the reality is there is an amendment. The House of Lords has voted for that amendment and all members of parties across the board have voted for it. And I think in itself, that's quite a powerful moment. Um, it comes to the Commons, uh, as my understanding, provided it finishes on Monday, on Tuesday next week. Uh, and we are working hard to make sure my colleagues understand and recognise that it is coming. Our biggest, our biggest problem at the moment is trying to get my colleagues focused on this because of COVID. So much of what we do at the moment in Parliament is around the, uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, and um, therefore it's difficult and focus, but I, I believe one by one, we are beginning to get them to notice that this is actually coming back. I think it's not over if, it, uh, if the government manages to defeat it in the Commons, because it will come back to the Lords. And there is another amendment, which uh, I have drafted with some colleagues, uh, which answers some of the government's questions. Uh, and I believe that if it isn't agreed with the government, the Lords should put that in to the, into the bill again and send it back to the Commons. Uh, and this time, I think, uh, with those questions answered, such as there were concerns about Parliament not having the final say, uh, and they were issued about how courts may then start to trigger these reviews themselves uh, and uh, basically rule over Parliament. And I think those are answered. I think, first of all, they were, uh, they're not real. Uh, uh, the it's the government trying to find excuses, but we can rectify all of that and have done in this new amendment. So I'm hoping that uh, and I'm in discussion with the government that maybe they might just accept the changes to that and accept this and bind it into the bill. I suspect first time around they won't, uh, but if they don't, then I simply say to the Lords, just do it again and send it back to us this time with those changes. Thank you. Um, I also have a question for Rahima, is why have the, 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 your people, the, the Uyghurs, and forgive me if I don't use your pronunciation, attracted such animosity from the regime? Is it simply because of the religion? Well, it's a combination of all. Um, uh, of course, Chinese government never like anyone different, you know, a political view or even different language, even if you look to different. Um, but the most important uh, thing here is in my, um, there is a saying in, in Uyghur, we say, Uyghur non yuriki pok pok, is uh, when you steal someone's, uh, when you steal from someone, you always have this very unsettled heart. So um, Uyghurs are the uh, historically, historic owner of that land and uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, occupation, although they say the Xinjiang is, uh, is uh, you know, historically part of China, but the name itself is Xinjiang, new territory. So um, because of this uh, historical background and also the former, uh, be, prior to CCP uh, occupation, we had two independence, uh, even though it was very brief. So they always had this fear that people will ri rise up and uh, will uh, attack uh, Chinese people or the regime. And even though China, uh, CCP became so powerful, uh, at least over the 20, 30 years, but they are they still like paranoid, uh, paranoid about the uh, so-called separatism and uh, terrorism. And also the, uh, the region, it's absolutely wealthy, oil, uh, natural gas, and also the cotton, 84% cotton comes from the region. It's a very wealthy region and also political, geographical, importance 
And now we look at the Xi Jinping's dream or the China, new China dream, the one belt, one road. Again, it starts from the, the heart of the Silk Road, the, uh, the Kashgar. And uh, therefore, say stability is the uh, most important. So they're playing this stability and security as the most important uh, for, for, for the country and using that, trying to wipe out the Uyghurs. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's very clear. Um, we've got time for just one more very quick question. And I wanted to just ask Dr. Tang how he thinks the West can push back effectively against the human rights abuses when China appears to be infiltrating Western commerce so effectively and the waking the West very dependent upon them. I'm sorry, Dr. Tang, that there isn't a long time to answer this, but if you were able to give us a quick answer, I would be very grateful. Um, yes, uh, there are many uh, recommendations in this report, and, and some people also have good ideas. Uh, but uh, I may answer this question briefly in this way. Um, we should uh, start something that uh, facilitated uh, Chinese uh, censorship and uh, civilian system. Um, you know, uh, many uh, Western uh, the, uh, the tech giants and uh, companies uh, provided Chinese government with technologies and uh, and trainings and equipment uh, to to tighten the the, the control um, on information. And uh, and uh, we should stop that. And we should stop um, helping Chinese government uh, to um, uh, to. Uh, uh, like uh, strengthening its uh, its uh, uh, total surveillance. So many Western countries prioritize um, business over uh, human rights, and and I think uh, this is not engagement. This is uh, unprincipled engagement, and that's uh, that's similar to appeasement. And we should not appease this totalitarian uh, dictatorial regime. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the time has run away with us and I really apologize that we aren't able, haven't got the time to take more questions. I mean, this has been an utterly fascinating evening and I think we could have continued with this event for a lot longer. Um, but sadly, the time has run away. And I would firstly like to thank Ben Rogers for all the hard work that he has put into producing this excellent and somewhat chilling report. And I would like to thank the other members of the team, Fiona Bruce, David Burroughs, Luke, and others who also took part in this inquiry. I think we've heard from outstanding speakers this evening who've given us fascinating insights. And we've heard some heart-rending stories from you from, with the uh, exception of Ian from you all. And I just think that it will live with us. And I really thank you so much for coming and sharing really painful personal stories tonight, but it's uh, really illustrated the importance of this report. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions and I really apologize that we haven't had more time to take them. I would also like to echo Ben's thanks to all those who gave evidence that enabled this report to be written. Um, it's a very, very brave thing to speak out against a regime like this. We've seen extensive press coverage on this report in the last few days, which I think the government will find hard to ignore. And I hope it will provoke further conversation about human rights in China and how the British government should react. So I thank everybody for attending and I am going to close the meeting. Many thanks. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thanks. Good night.